Radio 4. And now a tribute to one of radio's best-loved actors, the late Norman Shelley, a man of many voices. Cottleston, Cottleston, Cottleston pie A fly can't bird, but a bird can fly Ask me a riddle and I reply Cottleston, Cottleston, Cottleston pie Short words are best And the old words when short Are best of all I have been thinking, Larry and an idea most excellent I have. And you, sir? Hmm. <laughs> excellent, I hope. <laughs> oh, this is the end of everything. At least it is the end of the career of Toad, which is the same thing. Farewell, all good things. You will not remember me. But I shall remember you. When Norman Shelley talked, as he often did in recent years, about how he'd like to be remembered, he always said, with apparent modesty, that he'd settled for simply Norman Shelley, actor. But then he'd invariably grin and add, Mind you, dear boy, if you could show a little Christian charity and make that uh, Norman Shelley a good actor, hmm? I promise to smile down on you forever. How thrilled, then, old Norman would have been with the Times obituary describing him as one of the most applauded radio actors of his time. And how simply delighted he'd be with the intent of this programme, to celebrate his work and his talent. Though I suspect he'd cover up most of his feelings with a chuckle and nothing less than I deserve, dear boy. And that would be true, for Norman Shelley was a man of enormous versatility and talent. In a career spanning more than 60 years, he played more than a thousand different roles, and he was as comfortable in Shakespeare as he was, well, in the streets of Toy Town. Norman first appeared on stage just before his 16th birthday. It was the walk-on part as Father Time at London's Old Vic. That was in 1919, and he was still performing as Colonel Danby in The Archers until the day before he died last August. He'd taken part, of course, in various school plays and shows as an actor, but he never really thought about acting as a career. His plans were to become an aircraft designer, and he might well have gone to work for de Havilland's if the armistice ending the First War hadn't been signed just days after he was offered a job there. So instead, out of work and at a loose end, he one day went to see his sister rehearsing for her drama school's Christmas show. And then as happens in all the best showbiz films, one of the young actors didn't turn up, he was pressed into service as stand-in, did very well, and a whole new world opened up for him. The owner of the school was the well-known drama teacher Rosina Filippi, and earlier this year Norman recalled how influential she had been in pointing him towards the stage. After I'd been uh, rehearsing for a week or two, she said, Dear boy, I've got to give you some really terrible advice. You have got to be an actor. And I know the seriousness of what I'm saying. But you really must be an actor. It would be a crime if you didn't. You are splendidly equipped. I mean, you're a little bit short, perhaps. You won't always be able to play a romantic juvenile. I don't, don't mind. Later, he was to mind especially on the occasion when he was given Polonius while he was bursting to be Hamlet. But chagrin wasn't a natural part of his makeup, and he was soon far too busy enjoying life as an actor to worry about the roles that came his way. As long as they kept coming and presented some kind of challenge, he was happy. For several years, he was a member of various classical companies. He was with Russell Thorndike at the Old Vic. He toured with Charles Doran Shakespeare Company, which included Ralph Richardson and Donald Wolfitt. He toured with Ben Greet. He had a season with the Alexander Marsh Company, during which he clocked up his 130th Shakespearean role as Sebastian in Twelfth Night. He had several overseas tours, and then he joined the Gate Theatre for a series of contemporary plays from O'Neill's Hairy Ape to Lenormand's The Eater of Dreams. 
But ironically, it was his appearance at London's Children's Theatre that led to the most important development of his career. Because while Norman had been finding his feet on the stage, drama itself was finding a new medium, the wireless. The BBC had begun broadcasting in 1922, and when producers began to cast around for new voices, Norman's was one of those to catch their attention. A school's radio producer saw him at the children's theatre and invited him to do occasional broadcasts. I think it's safe to say I took to radio like a duck to water, you know, because very quickly I was established as a very, sort of, quite an important radio actor. And um, when I went to Australia in 1932, I went out there with an enormous radio reputation behind me, I don't know why. And I was absolutely astonished at the sort of reception I got in Australia as a radio actor. For several years, Norman happily straddled both radio and the stage. In 1932, for example, he left the microphone to go on a world tour with Lewis Casson and Sybil Thorndike. When he got back from that tour, one of his first wireless offers was to join this small, almost repertory company making plays for children's hour. One of the current productions was the much-loved Toy Town by S.G. Hume Beeman, and Norman accepted with enthusiasm. The cast was quite remarkable, and it covered an enormous range. I mean, you could produce any play in London with the average children's hour cast, you know. Really remarkable. Toy Town itself was quite unique, because we never rehearsed it. We only met half an hour before curtain up, so to say, just to mark up lights and uh, make any tiny little cuts or alterations. It been found a good idea from the last time we did it. But we were always separate. It took... Hume Beeman, who wrote Toy Town, he did the whole thing backwards. He first of all made the puppets. Then he, he made a, a theatre for them. And then he thought, well, I'd better write some plays for them to act. <laughs> so he did this. And he ran into Alan Holland, who was the then head of Children's Art. And he said, I wonder whether you'd be interested, Mr. Howland. I've made some puppets and I've written some plays for them. And these are the first two plays I've done. Would you like to read them? And Alan said, yes. And he took them home and he came back and he said, this is absolutely perfect broadcast material. You've got it dead right in one, you know. Norman's role was that of Dennis the Daxalt. And in this extract, he plays alongside Uncle Mac himself, Derek McCulloch, as Larry the Lamb. <coughs> I say, Dennis, I don't know how I can possibly manage any longer with only sevens a week pocket money. I always spend that before Tuesday. You see, I'm so awfully fond of lollipops. Oof, not enough it is, Larry, my friend. My threepence goes almost before I can look at it. I told the farmer so. I said, after us living in your barn all this time, our pocket money to four pence at least, I think you ought to raise. And what did he say? He said when I to do some work started and when your wool long enough grew for him some off to cut and sell, he would think about it. So I told him I often worked. I barked at a stranger who into the yard only the day before yesterday came. Quite right, Dennis, and your talk is getting much worse. I yeah. expect my wool would grow much quicker if I had more pocket money. Yeah, but I have been thinking, Larry, and an idea most excellent I have. Norman had a special affection for Dennis because playing him led to his first royal encounter. I had the great pleasure of playing for our beloved Queen and Princess Margaret when they were little children and King George VI and beloved Queen Mum. They were in Studio BB, which had a little balcony and rails. And in the middle of the broadcast, Princess Margaret got her head right through the railings and KG6 was quite determined she was suddenly going to dive in and join the cars. Yeah, I remember just grabbing her, like just waking her back. But he loved it so much, and I felt slightly worried about the Teutonic side of, of Dennis, but the king was marvellous. I remember him wanting to laugh so heartily. He stuffed a hanky in his mouth, and we saw them all afterwards, and it was great fun. Enjoyment of life was always very important to Norman, and he got so much pleasure from using his voice and the microphone that he decided to concentrate on radio, and he went to see Val Gilgood, who was then head of radio drama. 
I said I want to burn my boats theatrically and I would propose in future I would like to do my work with the microphone. I mean in radio because there I'm sure and you have always realized my wide range. I can play anything that I want to play or you want me to play. Val said, my dear fellow, I'd be delighted to have you. And I said, the only thing is, Val, you must keep me employed. Of course, I'm losing all, a great deal of the publicity of the theatre. But I shall be more than happy, because my audience to me is that fellow, the microphone. I remember Henry Ainley saying to me, isn't it marvellous, my dear boy? We are acting to 12 million people. I said, you're not, Harry. You're not. Our audience is one and two, probably rather elderly people, sitting in that tiny little home in front of a speaker. But that audience of one and two is multiplied anything between six and eight million times over. This is our audience. It's hearing Norman talking about his technique that explains his success as a radio actor. The actor must have an absolutely complete picture in his head of what he's doing. He must know if he can draw so much the better. I'm lucky I'm a painter. I always drew portraits of myself of the part, so it was a great help to me. And I clothed the part. I was also a costume designer, so that was a help. And I used to ask people who heard, said how much they enjoyed me in a certain play, and I said, what, what did I look like? They said, oh, we were men about six feet high, and I suppose probably about 55. Or you might have been 70. But I said, what colored hair? And he said, well, you were wearing a brown wig. My hair was white, actually. You know, and all these things, it sort of, it was like a scrambler telephone. It all, if it's, this was right in the actor's head, it all unscrambled itself in the listener's head. And they got a complete and absolute picture, which is, I think, one of the reasons why I got such a, a really, absurd reputation as a good radio actor. But of all his characterizations, there's no doubt at all, certainly there was none in Norman's mind, that his most successful was that of the bear of very little brain, Winnie the Pooh. Winnie the Pooh is the most important thing in my entire life. I was very, very delighted and honored to be assured by A. Milne on one of his wonderful Christmas parties. He used to have a wonderful party every Christmas in Brown's Hotel. All the real top of the theatrical world was there. It was a wonderful, wonderful party. And I created Pooh in July the 7th, 1939, just before the war. And Milne was absolutely sweet. He said, dear Norman Shelley, Needless to say, you are my favorite, favorite actor. And I want to say to you quite solemnly, I regard you as the definitive poo, and I never want to hear anyone else play it. And what you have done is quite phenomenal. I said, well, eh, it's very, very sweet of you to say, but do let me say here and now, apart from the debt I owe you for writing poo, my other debt is to Ernest Shepherd. And he said, but why? I said, well, people have so often said to me, how do you know what sort of voice Pooh had? I said, you only have to look at Shepherd's drawings, you know at once. You cannot go wrong. Being a member of the Royal Zoological Society also helped. I used to study bears and look at them and translate their little grumbling, grisly little voices back into sort of an English usage. If you think small bears, real small bears, they have little small voices on them. <laughs> Very strange. And I used this for poo, and um, sometimes you get down there, but I can't play poo standing up straight. I have to stand, um, if I can get up straight, I stand like this, like that. And you have to remember very important things about Pooh. Pooh can't do that with his head. He can't nod downwards. He can move his head right and left. He can't lift his arms out sideways from his shoulders. They work this way. 
And you have to remember this. You have to remember also that his head is, for brains, he's stuffed full of sawdust and trouser buttons and things. This has a very limiting factor in your speech. And he thinks, as he says, I get fuzzy. And he doesn't think I get muddled, you know. It's very difficult to talk. And you can hear the sort of thinking processes going on in his head, which does make for a rather splendid sound. The voices of the, the animals we did in a, in a kind of committee. Geoffrey Winkert and, and myself were both old Ben Gretchen actors. And Ben Green had a voice like that, you know. <laughs> we did that. B.G. is this incredible sort of voice of doom voice he had. <laughs> so Geoffrey and I were talking about voices, and Geoffrey was going to play Eeyore, and he said, you don't have to look any further, play him like B.G. So that, which indeed Geoffrey did, was absolutely tremendous. <laughs> and just how tremendous, you can judge for yourself in this extract from Eeyore Has a Birthday, in which I was the narrator. Eeyore, the old grey donkey, stood by the side of the stream and looked at himself in the water. <coughs> then he turned and walked slowly down the stream for 20 yards, splashed across it and walked slowly back on the other side. Then he looked himself in the water again. <coughs> Pathetic. That's what it is. Pathetic. No better from this side than from the other. But nobody minds. Nobody cares. Pathetic. That's what it is. There was a crackling noise in the bracken behind, and out came Pooh. Good morning, you. Good morning, Pooh Bear. If it is a good morning, which I doubt. Why, what's the matter? Nothing, Pooh Bear, nothing. We can't all, and some of us don't. Mm -hmm. That's all there is to it. Can't all what? Gaiety, song and dance. Here we go round the mulberry bush. Oh. Uh, what mulberry bush is that? Bon homie. Oh. French word meaning bon homie. Oh, I see. I'm not complaining, but there it is. Yes. Pooh sat down on a large stone and tried to think this out. You know, it sounds to me like a riddle. And I never was much good at riddles, being a bear of very little brain. So I think I'll sing my song about riddles called Cottleston Pie. Cottleston, Cottleston, Cottleston Pie. A fly can't bird, but a bird can fly. Ask me a riddle and I reply. Cottleston, Cottleston, Cottleston Pie. Yes. Cottleston, Cottleston, Cottleston Pie. A fish can't whistle and neither can I. Ask me a riddle and I reply, Cottleston, Cottleston, Cottleston Pie. I first met Norman in about 1935, just when I joined the BBC Children's Hour. And I'd known him and worked with him off and on for very nearly 45 years. He was a dear man to work with, maddening in the extreme. He would do all sorts of extraordinary things. He would tend to fall asleep at a microphone when he wasn't actually speaking. And one of his most infuriating characteristics was turning up late for rehearsals. So much so that it became a, almost a classical saying. He was living at that time near the canal at Tring. And when he'd arrive and everybody had already got going some minutes, he would say, sorry I'm late, old boy, sorry old late. Fog on the road from Tring and fog on the road from Tring has been handed down as an almost Johnsonian saying to this day. Well, Children's Hour followed up the success of Winnie the Pooh with the adaptation of another favourite story, Kenneth Graham's The Wind in the Willows. In some of the earlier programmes of this production, Norman played, I think it was Ratty, but eventually he moved up to the higher echelon and became Toad, Toad of Toad Hall. Oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, this is the end of everything. At least it is the end of the career of Toad, which is the same thing. The popular and handsome Toad. The rich and hospitable Toad. The Toad so free and careless and debonair. How can I hope to be ever set at large again? Who have been imprisoned so justly for stealing so handsome a motor car in such an audacious manner and with such dreadful cheek bestowed upon such a number of fat red-faced policemen? Stupid animal that I was. When the Second War came, many BBC people were evacuated from Broadcasting House in London to temporary studios in Evesham, where the drama department set up what was to become known as the Munich Crisis Rep, with Norman as one of the leading members. And it was then that his great talent for creating different voices was pressed into service, helping the war effort. At the time, this was a closely guarded secret, known only to a handful of people, including the Prime Minister, Winston Churchill. During the time when Winston was having seven sleepless nights in a row, trying to ensure the safe evacuation of something like 367,000 men off the beaches of Dunkirk, right in the middle of it, his secretary came in and said, Sir, three gentlemen from the British Council want to see you. When he said, what do they want? He said, I don't really know, sir. And he said, well, tell them they can have five minutes. And he was dispatched and brought them in and said, well, gentlemen, what can I do, Goyle? And they said, sir, in company with everyone else in the British Isles, we all read your marvellous speech which you made from the floor of the house. Which you may remember ended, we were fighting the towns, we were fighting the landing grounds, we were fighting the hill, we were never surrender. And they said, well, he said, yes, well, what? He said, could you spare time to record a ten-minute disc of the last ten minutes? We would like you to send it to President Roosevelt and ask him to broadcast it across the North American continent. And when he said, he made what I've always described in talking about it as the Winston Churchill understatement of all time, of his many understatements, he said, I'm rather busy. We'll have to get some actor to do it. And grass on year, the lot fell on me because the BBC were instructed to find someone who could do a Churchill. And there's people said, well, you'd better get hold of Norman Shelley. I've heard him doing it, and he's quite remarkable. When he has added a rider to the little man and said, mark you if this purports to be me. I shall have to hear and approve. We can't have bogus Churchill voices going out over American air. You must remember I have an American mother. In 1941, Norman took a more direct part in the war. He joined the Air Transport Auxiliary, the ATA, flying being his other great love. His job was to ferry planes all over the country, and this had to be done at very low altitudes, making it a rough, uncomfortable business which soon took its toll on his health, and within 18 months he was invalided out of the service, with the M.O. telling him, we think you'll be safer on the air, when indeed he really felt he belonged. And Norman continued to enchant younger listeners, and at older ones too, with his interpretations of Pooh Bear, Dennis the Daxon, and Toad of Toad Hall. It was clearly one of the happiest periods of his career. Someone asked me, they said, what was it like, Norman, playing in children's art? And I said, well, I've often heard the virtues of sheer luxury extolled as, as uh, bathing in asses' milk or bathing in champagne. And I said, well, I, I haven't had any experience in bathing in either liquid, and I wouldn't very much enjoy the asses' milk, I have a feeling, because I don't like milk, but um, I do love champagne. And I can only say that the nearest thing to champagne that I know of was playing in children's art. Soon after the war, Norman joined what he called the Clots Club, when he had the first of two serious coronaries. But, again in his own words, he was as tough as old boots, and he was soon back at work behind the microphone. Among those ever ready to cast him was Raymond Rakes, one of the most talented producers we ever had in radio drama. 
Two years ago, on Norman's 75th birthday, they talked together about the rapport that led to them doing 75 plays together. So it's not surprising that they're talking together, is it? Right, yes. Well, we do know something about it together. I think and each other, I think. I, I suspect Because so. I think very much we think the same way about radio. This is How do you think about radio? Well, I think of it as a marvellous kind of painting medium, which is all done through the voice. I, if I want to listen, I'm teaching at the moment in Birmingham at the old Birmingham Repertory Theatre Drama School. And uh, if I want to listen critically, I invariably keep my eyes shut. Because then I, I hear with the most critical faculty of my body, which is through, through the ears. When, in 1955, Norman was invited to select a play for the light programme series Stars in Their Choices, it was to Raymond Rakes he turned as producer of J.B. Priestley's Johnson Over Jordan. I have been a foolish, greedy and ignorant man. Yet I've had my time beneath the sun and the stars. I've known the returning strength and sweetness of the season, blossom on the branch and the ripening of fruit. The earth is nobler than the world we have built upon it. What have I done that I should have a better world, even though there is in me something that will not rest? until it sees paradise. Farewell, all good things. You will not remember me, but I shall remember you. In front of the microphone, Norman established a partnership that was to become one of the most famous in radio, a partnership with the great Carlton Hobbs. And I'm rather proud to think that it was in fact, myself, who did the casting of these two. We started, I think, very nearly the first adaptation, it was by Felix Felton, of some of the Sherlock Holmes stories. And for 25 years, starting in Children's Hour, Norman played Watson to Hobbo's Sherlock Holmes. Oh, Watson, may I come in? Oh, of course, my dear fellow, of course. Thank you. My wife's just going to bed. Uh, I'll call her down again. No, 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 pray don't disturb her. Oh, very well. Ah, I see you still smoke that Arcadia mixture of your bachelor days. <laughs> come and sit down. <laughs> How do you know that? That fluffy ash on your lapels. Mm. There's no mistaking it. <laughs> Brandy, sir? Hmm, with pleasure. Oh, I'm sorry to see you've got the British workman in the house. Mm -hmm. He's a token of evil. Not the drains, I hope. No, the gas. <laughs> but how did you know? He's left two nail marks from his boots on your linoleum. Where? There. Just where the light strikes it. Huh? You see? <laughs> Excellent, Hope. <laughs> Elementary. <sighs> your good health and Mrs. Watson's too. And yours. Hmm. Norman was very pleased with his radio performances, rightly so, of course. But occasionally, but only very occasionally, he would show a touch of bitterness about what he regarded as lack of recognition. I feel very sad sometimes. I mean, knowing, uh, judged by the work I have done in radio, I, I, I very much feel that uh, I'm sorry I'm not amongst the list of all my friends who have knighthoods. And I think one has deserved it. I was more pleased than I can say when Hobbo, Carlton Hobbs, got his OBE because this was given to us, the real serious radio actors. It was for us all. And we were highly delighted that he should be the recipient of it. But Norman's real consolation was, like every actor's, his audience. And in that sense, he continued to be rewarded, appearing in play after play, mainly, of course, on radio, but every now and again on stage and occasionally in television. Not even a second coronary made him think of retirement. Indeed, long after most people have settled for collecting their old age pension and the quiet life, old Norman, at the age of 73, launched himself on another strand of a remarkable career when he was asked to join the Archers. I was truly delighted. I think Martin Eslin must have been responsible for it. Martin was our then head of drama. 
and I had always flatly refused to have anything to do with the BBC repertory company. And I went, I was rather desperate. I'd had a really horrid three months patch of very, very slim living indeed. And he must have got on to Tony Shrine, I think, and said, what about having Norman Shelley in, in the arches instead of me taking him into the rep, which I'm thinking of doing? And Tony Shrine, I'm glad to say, jumped at the other. It was rather nice. And um, when I told my wife about this, she was dying of the demon cancer. And she said, darling, I'm so thrilled that you were starting a new career at the age of 73. But I do hope I don't bitch the whole thing up for you by going and dying the day before you start. That would be too awful. But bless her cotton sock, she gave me three clear weeks. Neither that personal trauma nor yet another painful illness, this time a kidney stone, ever showed in his performance as Colonel Danby. Oh, put the kettle on, shall I? No, no, I'll, I'll do it. Uh, I'll do, look, look, uh, why don't you just sit down? What? <sighs> you all right, Freddy? Oh, of course I am. You're looking flushed. Am I? Yes. What's wrong? Oh, nothing. But there's something I'd like to say to you. I, I was going to do it earlier, as a matter of fact, but then I thought it best to, well, dispose of the pig first. Freddy! No, no, don't interrupt, please, Laura. Laura, I, I, I would like to ask you to marry me. Of course, you don't have to decide immediately. But I would like us to, perhaps, to talk it over. Well, what do you say? Sadly, the lady said no. But the colonel, obviously made of the same stuff as Norman, shrugged off his disappointment and carried on life as cheerfully as ever. Meanwhile, Norman astonished everyone by going back on stage in the West End, in Tom Stoppard's Dirty Linen, and accepting the grueling regime of eight performances a week and regularly travelling between London and Birmingham, where The Archers is recorded. No one could understand what drove him on. Kind of demon, I suppose. It's not a seizure. To... But I, I very much scorned the theatre the last time. I've usually gone back into the theatre about once every ten years. And this is primarily, A, to show myself that I know how to do it. And B, to show the general public the old bugger's still alive. But eventually it did become too much for even Norman's constitution. I have now decided that at 77 I've proved my point. I've just concluded I've officially announced my retirement as a theatre actor. Because the hassle of the theatre, the awful, what I call the tyranny of the theatre, is too much. Never being able to do anything in the evenings. Very worrying, what you have to start thinking of inside clock has to be properly organized for meals you know it's a terrible business and it really is tyranny i call it he also decided to give up his flat and move into an actor's home an act which seemed to many like his acceptance that his career was at last at an end it doesn't you see uh, i mean as long as my health holds up because i shall still be Delightedly playing the archers until one runs out of sea. Dear old Norman ran out of sea last August while on his way home from recording another episode of The Archers. He never did stop working. David Davis presented that tribute to Norman Shelley, and the program was produced in Birmingham by Jock Gallagher.